So have you seen this TikTok yet? In 2017, I was in a club in New York City and he just started like touching me up and like fully like up my leg, like in my crotch, like. And then I looked to my left to see who it was and it was this really famous fashion designer. And it created quite a stir. Let's talk about it. So that TikTok was made by a model named Owen Mooney, where he calls out Alexander Wang for some sexual assault that he experienced perpetrated by Wang in 2017. It's created quite a stir in the fashion industry and outside of it, because Alexander Wang is a well-known designer who's also well-known for his partying tricks. It started a larger conversation about accountability within the fashion industry and about how the Me Too movement largely failed the LGBTQ community. After this video was shared, it, it caused a tidal wave of new allegations to come out against Alexander Wang, and now a number of his accusers have lawyered up with a lawyer named Lisa Bloom. She was also a lawyer for Harvey Weinstein. So that's weird. Let's talk about it. My name's Leija. I'm a real life lawyer on a mission to demystify the law and how it affects your everyday life. That's right, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. Nothing that I say should be construed as legal advice and you should always seek the advice of a licensed attorney if you have any legal questions. Let's dive in. All right, so according to his Wikipedia page, Alexander Wang is a Capricorn, which is disappointing for our kind, if these allegations are true. He founded his namesake fashion brand in 2005, which won a pretty big award in the fashion industry in 2008 that kind of skyrocketed into fame. Then he became the creative director of Balenciaga from 2012 to 2015. He's known for his urban inspired designs and his creative use of the color black. And he's also known for his party lifestyle and various shenanigans. He has a status as a New York party figure, which I think takes quite a lot of effort or quite a lot of debauchery to gain such a status. And that's also where a lot of the alleged assaults took place. So the avalanche of accusations against him started when this model, Owen Mooney, posted this TikTok where he talked about an unnamed prominent fashion designer who sexually assaulted him. Then the comments started rolling in and people guessed that it was Alexander Wang, so he created another video saying that it was him. But this comment surprised me just because they actually got it right and turns out Alexander Wang is a massive sexual predator. These TikToks were picked up by an Instagram called Shit Model Management, which from what I understand is a anonymous model managed Instagram account where they kind of try to peel back the layers of issues within the fashion industry. It was also picked up by an Instagram called Diet Prada that talks a lot about the fashion industry and it led to a number of other people to come forward and accuse Alexander Wang of similar assaults or worse assaults or assaults that they witnessed. This includes trans people who said that he attempted to expose their genitals in public and it includes allegations of him drugging people. If these allegations are true, it kind of just seems like another symptom of becoming famous and gaining prestige and money. You kind of start to think that the rules don't apply to you. He potentially didn't even think that he would ever have to face consequences, allegedly. So after gaining this traction in Diet Prada and shit model management, the story was picked up by a number of major news sources like the New York Times, Harper's Bazaar, In Style, People, The Guardian, and eventually Vogue. Though there were a number of people that noted that Vogue was a little slow to pick up the story. There's a lot of accusations floating around that the fashion industry likes to protect its people even if they are doing bad things, which sounds familiar. There are many celebrities that continue to follow Wang on social media and haven't really said anything or addressed these allegations. For his part, Wang has flatly and vehemently denied any sort of wrongdoing or any assault has ever taken place. Now, a number of his accusers have hired attorney Lisa Bloom. She has a long history of representing victims of sexual assault and other violations. Her mother, Gloria Allred, also had a long history of doing that. It's kind of a family legacy at this point. Lisa Bloom has represented Bill Cosby's accusers. She represented the accusers of Bill O'Reilly and which led to his termination at Fox News. So it's really peculiar then that Lisa Bloom agreed to represent Harvey Weinstein. Now she claims she acted as his advisor, but either way she was an attorney advising Harvey Weinstein on the legalities of his sexual assault issues that he faced. It's unclear why she agreed to advise him. She seems in post in interviews after the fact that she maybe regrets it. I can't really fathom that she wouldn't have realized in accepting the job that it could be problematic, but it could have been because it was a really famous case and she enjoys working with famous people and on famous cases. It could be because there was probably a huge paycheck attached to that representation. I know Harvey Weinstein spent literal millions of dollars on his legal defense team. Those could have swayed her to make this kind of what seems like career killing decision. I don't know. 
It's very unclear to me. It's very fishy as someone who vehemently ad advocates for victims' rights and then goes to advise someone so heinous. And she did so to the best of her ability. And as attorneys, we are ethically required to zealously advocate for our clients, meaning represent them, advocate for them to the best of our abilities. We don't have to represent everyone, so she chose to do that. But once she chose to represent him, she had to give it her best. And it made sense from Harvey Weinstein's perspective to hire her because she's been on the other side of the table. She's represented victims her whole career, so she knows exactly what it takes to undermine their stories. And there was a leaked memo that she sent to Harvey Weinstein, which she advocates for doing just that against Rose McGowan, one of Harvey Weinstein's most outspoken accusers. Rose has called for the disbarment of Bloom. And I've heard that Rose has sued Lisa Bloom as well, though I didn't substantiate those claims, so I don't actually know. So, but in the leaked memo, Lisa Bloom said, I feel equipped to help you against the roses of the world because I have represented so many of them. She also added, we can place an article regarding her becoming increasingly unglued so that when someone Googles her, this is what pops up and she's discredited. Again, I'm unclear why she chose to use all of her experience in her long career to help someone like Harvey Weinstein, but I'm happy that it didn't ultimately end up working for him in the end. However, this hasn't really seemed to affect her career at all. She was hired by victims of Jeffrey Epstein to represent them, and now she's being hired by alleged victims of Alexander Wang to represent them. So she seems to be doing fine. And it's probably bad news for Wang that she's taken up representing them because she has a reputation for using publicity to her advantage. Okay, so what would a case like this against Alexander Wang by his victims, alleged victims, what would it look like? So first thing to get clear is that there's a difference between criminal laws and civil laws. So on the criminal side, there are criminal sexual assault type charges that could be brought against him if this is true. Those would have to be brought by a prosecutor, not by a private lawyer like Lisa Bloom. It's unclear at this point if charges are being pressed or investigated at this point. On the other side, you have civil law and you have what's called torts. Tort law, as I've explained in numerous other videos, is a civil lawsuit that one party, one private party, can bring against another private party for injury of some sort. And there are torts for assault and battery. These claims will probably be brought either in New York or California state court. And it differs depending on the state a little bit how they're enforced, but the elements of each claim, of each liability, are similar amongst the states. One interesting thing that I'll note is that assault is often confused for battery. Under the law, what you understand to be assault, that is someone grabbing you when you don't consent, some sort of sexual act that you haven't consented to, that's actually battery under the law. Under civil law, assault occurs when someone does something, some intentional act, that puts fear in the victim of imminent bodily harm. It does not require a touch. It does not require any touching. If someone feared that their body would be harmed because of an intentional act of another, that's good enough for assault. Where touching becomes involved, then it's a battery. A battery is an unwanted or harmful touch that was intentionally perpetrated on the victim by the defendant. These are two torts that the alleged victims of Alexander Wang could bring against him in civil court that would result in monetary damages for emotional pain and suffering, for if they had to go to the doctor, see a therapist, if they lost work and wages, there's a lot of things that can be covered on this. And there can be punitive damages, meaning above and beyond the actual cost to the victim, just some sort of monetary fine against the defendant for doing something really bad. Often along with assault and battery, victims can claim intentional infliction of emotional distress. This is where the defendant did something intentionally or recklessly that was extremely outrageous and that caused severe emotional distress in the victim. As you can kind of figure out that often comes hand in hand with assault and battery. Would Wang have any defense if these cases were brought against him? One common defense to these types of torts is the idea of intent, meaning that people can defend themselves against these torts by saying they did not make an intentional act, they didn't do anything intentionally to commit the assault or battery. Here he probably wouldn't have that defense because the intentional grabbing of someone's crotch, that's clearly an intentional act. A questionable intent comes up if someone like physically forces you or threatens you to if you don't do something. And here that doesn't seem to be the case. So he probably wouldn't have that defense. His main defense seems to be that he simply didn't do it. If he didn't do it, if they can't prove that he did it, then he can't be held liable for these 
offenses. And it might be the case that it'll be hard for them to prove that he did this, especially because a lot of them sound like they happened in instances where there was a lot of drugs and alcohol involved, it was dark, maybe no one else was there to see it. It's really hard to prove that something happened if you don't have eyewitnesses or credible witnesses. And Alexander Wang has time on his side. In New York State, the statute of limitations to bring an assault and battery claim against someone is one year. And in California, it's two. So the assaults that happened in 2017 and 2018, he could probably claim that the statute of limitations has passed and they can't be bringing that claim now. Though for the more serious allegations, the statutes of limitation might be longer depending on the state. Basically, statutes of limitations make sure that anyone who is wronged timely brings an action against the person so that there aren't these ages old lawsuits being brought up and clogging up the courts. So a lot of times what happens when people accuse other people of sexually assaulting them is the accused, the defendant, brings a claim of defamation against his or her accusers. Could that happen here? Let's discuss. So defamation includes both libel, which is written, and slander, which is spoken, defamatory comments. Frankly, Wang's case would be hard because he's a public figure, which changes the dynamic a little bit when it comes to defamation. Basically, we want to protect the public's ability to make comment on people who have chosen to put themselves out in the public. We want their rights to be protected so that they can speak out against people. It's freedom of the press 101. So first off, he would have to show that the statements against him were false. Again, that's hard, but if they lose their case, that might galvanize him to bring this claim for defamation. It's a case of he said, she said, or he said, he said. It would depend on the jury to determine whether or not Wang should be believed or his accusers should be believed. It's a credibility issue. But if the statements against him are actually true, he can't bring this case. He also has to show that the person making the defamatory statement did so with what's known as actual malice, meaning they knew that it was false or they recklessly disregarded whether or not it was false. This would be hard against someone who genuinely believed that they had a sexual assault claim. It would be hard if they win their sexual assault claim. If they lose their sexual assault claim, that would probably galvanize him to bring a claim like this against the alleged victims. That's why I and the news media, you'll always see us saying allegedly before everything because we don't want to spread information that we don't know is true or not and say that it is true because we could then be liable for defamation and I'm not trying to get sued here, people. And then finally, to bring a case for defamation, he would have to show damage. And I think that would be easy in this case because his reputation is being just drug through the mud right now. And the, that is attached to his brand, his label and his finances. So I don't think that element would be hard for him to prove. But if they're true, then he doesn't have a case. So likely a defamation claim in this case is not realistic, but that being said, it's still questionable whether they'll be able to prove the allegations against him or if they're even gonna bring a lawsuit at all, it could settle outside of court and we'll never know. And whether or not these allegations are true, they have raised important questions about transparency in the fashion industry, about exploitation of models, and about the Me Too movement and whether or not it served the LGBTQ community because a lot of his accusers that are coming forward are gay men and trans women. But clearly, the Me Too movement has a lot more work to do. So what are your thoughts? Do you believe the accusers? Do you believe Wang? What can be done in the fashion and beauty industry to increase transparency? And what can be done to make it so that the types of behavior that Alexander Wang is accused of no longer are allowed to flourish in the industry? Because if the allegations are true, this has been going on for years and it's only now being addressed. What can we do? I wanna hear from you. Comment down below if you have any ideas. Comment down below if you have ideas of other things you want me to talk about, other questions, things you want me to address. I am here and I'm happy to help out. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you found this video informational or entertaining. See you next time. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good night. Goodbye.